I'm Ash Huggett, and you're listening to the Strong by Ash podcast, where we talk all things fitness, business, and lifestyle. Hey guys, welcome back to a new episode. Episode number 14, I believe. I was just looking at the numbers, and that's pretty cool because I didn't actually think I was going to be getting this far or this deep into these podcasts, but here we are. And um, with episode number 14, I've got a special guest coming onto the show. Um, I've got Mr. Jacob Skepis coming on. Now, if you don't know who Jacob is, Jacob has a mighty resume. Uh, He is the owner and director of JPS Health and Fitness down in Melbourne and Victoria, and he has worked with thousands of people. He's literally worked his way up to become one of the most influential and most well-respected coaches within the industry in the entire world, which is a it's pretty crazy to say that, uh, especially when I'm you know speaking to him. So Jacob has uh, a background in bodybuilding and powerlifting. And he's taken many, many clients to become champions and even to world champions. He and his brother Sam have created an educational platform called JPS Education. And they have an abundance of knowledge that they are constantly sharing out on their Instagram pages. And they're definitely improving the standard of personal training around the world. I'm fortunate enough to personally work with Jacob as my coach for the last year and a half for my up and coming show. And I've learned a huge amount of information and education from him along the way. He's definitely a man with a wealth of knowledge. And I was lucky enough to sit with him to discuss female physique enhancement. Now, you're going to find that we are we do talk about you know with the term female and uh, exercises that predominantly more females use than males. But please bear in mind that the same rules and protocols apply for both males and females if they're wanting to build muscle. So if you're wanting to build muscle or improve your physique through strength training, then this episode is going to benefit you greatly. So listen in because there's an abundance of takeaways from this. And if you aren't following him on Instagram, then do yourself a favor and go check him out because his content is next level. And it will definitely shape the way that you train in the gym, I assure you. So you can find him by searching Jacob Skepis. And his surname is S-C-H-E-P-I-S. You can also find his gym at JPS Health and Fitness, which also have a great amount of content on there too. And the big one, JPS Education. So definitely worth a follow for all those three pages but that's it for me and i hope you enjoy the episode hey guys like i mentioned in the intro uh we have a special guest today on the episode and we have mr jacob skepis 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 however you want to say it mate it's uh it's still mighty impressive (laughs) um mate thanks for uh, coming on the episode today i know that a lot of people will be very very excited to hear what you have to say um so thank you so much for taking some time out to chat with me no thank you ash it's a pleasure to be here man i'm very excited to yeah have a conversation with you man we Um, have plenty during the week but uh this one's gonna be a little bit different no doubt we do we have uh many people listening and many people watching so uh mate i uh like i just said like uh, i've given every, every bit of an introduction with yourself but i'd like to be able to hear it from your end of things like who is Jacob Skepis and, you know, what do you do and how have you got to the position where you are now? Because you are, you know, um, a man with high stature um, who has a lot of authority in the industry, um, a lot of education, a lot of knowledge and a lot of, a lot of respect from a lot of people. So, um, mate, how did you get to where you are now? Well, thank you. That was very, very kind of you. Um, Not sure I agree with all of uh, those sentiments, but thank you. Uh, where do I begin? Well, I was a chubby little kid growing up and I was always a little bit conscious of being chubby. And I had, um, you know, I was that kid who used to get chafing when he wore board shorts and I didn't like wearing, uh, you know, no t-shirt at the beach. So I used to always wear a rash vest and things like that. Um, and I got to about 15, 16 and one of my close friends at school had uh, started losing a lot of weight and uh, looking really good. And he was, becoming better at football and I was like into my sport and things like that. So I asked him, uh, you know, what he did. And he told me that he wasn't eating carbohydrates and that, uh, that's how he lost all the weight. And you just got to cut out the carbs. They make you fat. So I was 15 and, uh, I followed suit. And funnily enough, this is uh, Dr. Jake Lenarden of uh, break binge eating. And he's actually an eating uh, disorder researcher and, uh, doctor in uh, eating disorders now, funnily enough. And, uh, yeah, so we both started dieting. He got me into the gym 
I started lifting weights, trying to yeah, change how I looked. I had comments once when I was in year nine swimming carnival. Uh, somebody said that I had like the old man boobs or what it was, and that kind of stuck. And when I started training at the gym, I literally trained chest every single session five times a week to change the architecture and the look of uh, you know my chest. Um, and lo and behold, not eating a lot of carbohydrates and uh, learning to starve yourself. I was pretty disciplined uh, with my training, my diet. I'd do cardio every day, all that kind of jazz. Um, I started losing a lot of weight and I got shredded. Uh, my goal was to look like Ben Cousins, the AFL footballer. And uh, I think by the time I was 20, I actually achieved that goal because my nickname at um, my VFL, which is like the Victorian Football League, so one down from the AFL, uh, they used to give me the nickname Cuz. So they used to call me Ben Cousins because I used to look like Ben Cousins and I was pretty insane in my training. So that all happened. And uh, yeah, I started really wanting to learn how to manipulate my body and um, I got quite good at it. Um, Sheerly out of just hard work, wasn't necessarily the most intelligent approach or anything like that. Um, And, you know, my football career ended because of injury. I could still train and lift weights. uh, So I got into bodybuilding, personal training, um, opened up a gym. I started realizing that there's got to be a better way uh, to, to look good and train as opposed to just killing yourself. It's not sustainable. So I started getting into the science um, and understanding how the body actually works to then be able to manipulate it um, in whatever way I please. And uh, from there, I started doing really well with my clients. I started getting other coaches who wanted to learn from me. I began uh, mentoring uh, coaches back in 20. 20- 13, I believe, so nearly seven years ago, uh, just at a coffee shop, basically telling them what not to do, just to learn from my mistakes, which I think is probably the best way to go about uh, educating people for the most part. Um, And yeah, over time, we built up JPS, which is my personal training company, uh, to have, you know, we've got over 20 employees, we're like 15 coaches, Uh, we coach people around the world for powerlifting, bodybuilding, gen pop kind of stuff, we have now... um, open different arms of the business. So I've got an education uh, branch of the business, which uh, now uh, teaches people and personal trainers around the globe, which is really cool. Um, And yeah, here we are along that journey. I've uh, had the privilege of becoming a father um, and to two beautiful young girls and uh, achieved many other great things besides, uh, you know, getting on a bodybuilding stage, powerlifting. Um, But yeah, that's a little bit about me. Ash. I'm not sure how much more you would, like to know the listeners really care about, but that's at least well, what, are you, what are you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> what am I wearing? Not a lot, man. You don't want me to stand up, put it that way. This is a COVID-19 lockdown in Melbourne. So it's a no pants policy. Oh, I miss those days. Mate, uh, that's very, very impressive. And, uh, you know, you are probably the right person to talk about this type of, uh, this topic that we want to discuss. Um, and it's about hypertrophy and, and basically how to build muscle. Um, I know there are a lot of people especially the people that listen to, um, to these podcasts are interested in, you know, coming into the gym and trying to like improve their physique. So phys- physique enhancement um, and, you know, building muscles obviously going to want to be one of the big blocks for them uh, wanting to, uh, they're, they're wanting to achieve when they are training. So mate, do you want to explain a little bit about hypertrophy um, and what are the big rocks in building muscle? Yeah. So Hypertrophy is a bit of a buzzword. Um, It's like uh, anything related to physiology. People get really excited to hear these terms because they're scientific, they're a little bit mysterious and it gives you the, it gives people the impression that you know what you're talking about, right? Uh, But hypertrophy is basically just the enlargement of the muscle. We have two types of uh, hypertrophy. We have fiber hypertrophy and then we have sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, which is swelling of the cell. But for the most part, when we talk about hypertrophy, we're talking about increasing the size of the muscle fibers and when it comes to muscle growth um, i always like to teach people that you can build muscle doing pretty much any activity because muscle growth isn't an exercise or activity dependent uh outcome right so we don't actually train for hypertrophy hypertrophy is just something that happens because of what we do when we train because when we stress the body in a certain way, um, it's very adaptive organism. It has um, built-in mechanisms that will ensure that next time it's exposed to that similar type of stress, it has an enhanced ability to be able to tolerate that stress. And that stress isn't as disruptive to the system, right? So this is basic physiology, but hypertrophy essentially is muscle getting bigger in response to exercise-induced stimulus. 
so this stimulus we talk about when we get in training and that's just a, another way of saying uh, the stress of the training. Uh, they're not the same, they're not synonymous, but very similar. So hypertrophy is induced when we get uh, a stimulus from exercise. And primarily uh, that's gonna come from what's called mechanical tension, which is basically the application of uh, force and stretch on a muscle uh, as it contracts and as it lengthens. So we've got to remember when we move, whether it's lifting weights or running, the muscle shortens, it contracts, and then it lengthens, okay? Um, so this force application and stretch of the muscle, it, it, the, the fibers experience this tension, right? Um, and basically the more of this tension we get, the stronger and more robust uh, hypertrophy we get from it. And you can think about running. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier, you can build muscle with any kind of exercise modality. If somebody's obese and never exercised before in their life and they start running, they will build muscle running. Will that build muscle long-term? Definitely not. And will they have to do a lot of running to build just a little bit of muscle? Sure, so it's not a very efficient way to build muscle, but they can build muscle. That's because they're still getting that force through the muscle as it contracts and that stretching um, and therefore they're getting the tension. Now. Obviously, running, as we know, probably isn't the best way to build muscle. But if you start running faster and faster and faster, you start producing more and more force. You start getting more and more you know, tension through the stretch and therefore more mechanical tension. So sprinting, high-intensity interval training, these things have shown in the literature to build muscle uh, on you know, novices and intermediates or people who have done those exercises before because you're still getting that tension. So it's really important to understand that muscle growth is just a tension-dependent process and we need to get that mechanical tension. Now, when we get into a little bit of the weeds about what this mechanical tension is, uh, you know, it has been described as, as an essential and necessary condition for promoting muscle growth. Um, and there's two other mechanisms of hypertrophy that people are a little bit unsure of as to how much they contribute to muscle growth. And that's muscle damage, uh, which pe most people will be familiar with, is when you, you feel that a lot of soreness after leg day and you can barely stand up and move. That's usually a sign that you've damaged the muscle. It's not muscle damage itself, but that delayed onset muscle soreness is, is a proxy for the, the muscle fibers um, you know, being damaged and perturbated. So that's uh, one potential uh, mechanism that is secondary to this mechanical tension and also mechanical tension, which other people would be familiar with as well, which is that uh, metabolite buildup in the muscle cell where it starts to swell and you get a good pump you feel that burn sensation whilst you're doing the exercise. It's a very acute kind of feeling. It's when you're doing the set, you just start feeling more and more swole, more and more burning, say your bicep curls or your hip thrusts or your, you know, your crab walks, whatever it is. Um, but that's again, not necessarily causing muscle growth. That might be a byproduct of this mechanical tension. Oh, that might actually cause mechanical tension because the fatigue is what's allowing us to get that tension. So in order to stimulate the muscle growth, Basically, we need to, uh, and get this mechanical tension, we need uh, force demands to be high. We need to impose a lot of force on the muscle. Uh, and the way that we can do that is either training heavy or training close to failure. So they're the two roads that we have to go down to get this mechanical tension. We can either lift really heavy and we can leave a few reps in reserve. You know, as long as we're within, say, five reps of failure, you know, RP, six, seven, you know, we're pretty good. We don't have to train too far with heavy loads. So I'm talking, you know, maybe less than 10 reps. But if we want to get that mechanical tension stimulus in the higher repetition ranges, and we can't leave any reps in the tank because the force demands won't be high enough. We need to actually train quite close to failure or to failure to get that mechanical tension when we're training with high rep range. So basically to get this tension stimulus and cause muscle growth, we've got one or two options. I think a combination of the two is best and that's going to be to lift heavy and keep a few reps in reserve. And again, this is probably a good idea with your compound lifts, the very fatiguing, such as your squats, your bench press, your deadlifts, anything that has like a lot of load through your spine, that's called axial loading. Um, you know, those kind of movements, uh, multi-joint exercise is gonna be a good idea to keep a few reps in reserve for safety reasons. Um, and then we also have to train close to failure or to failure in high repetition ranges. And we know our isolation exercises, our machines, those exercises are better suited to high rep ranges anyway. So we probably want to push those a little bit closer to failure. And you're not going to hurt yourself you know, in most cases, uh, you know, doing a bicep curl to failure or you know, doing uh, cable pull throughs or um, you know, adduction exercises on the machine. You know, you're not going to get injured doing you know, a 30 rep max. So you need to make sure you get close to failure on those exercises. So just to summarize all that, what that essentially means is we need to uh, satisfy two main criteria for muscle growth. Uh, we need high magnitudes of mechanical tension. So we need to train with sufficient uh, loads and close to failure. But there's an, a secondary component, 
it's additional to that tension stimulus I spoke about, and that's getting a sufficient exposure to that tension stimulus because you could do just one hard set and you're gonna get that mechanical tension stimulus, but that's probably not enough to cause the most optimal amount of muscle growth. So we need to do a sufficient amount of work and that's our training volume. So I think it's really important to consider those two things when we talk about hypertrophy. We need to get that mechanical tension, we need to train heavy and hard, and we need to get a sufficient exposure to that. So we need to devise a program that allows us to get an optimal amount of work, which is our, our sets, how many sets we're performing per muscle group. Um, and if we tick those two boxes, we're gonna build some good muscle. Okay. What do you, uh, just as a recommendation, what do you uh, advise for people? And how many sets per week should people be training? So if anybody's training currently and you're already following a training program, the amount of sets you should be doing should be based on the number of sets that you're currently doing. If you're feeling that your performance has plateaued, so you're not adding weight to the bar, you're not adding reps, and you're feeling really fatigued and beat up, you're not recovering from session to session, you're probably doing too much volume. Now that's assuming that you've got your sleep, your nutrition, your stress, your lifestyle factors, all those things under control, right? So we're going to assume all those things are under control. Now, if your performance is going up and you're feeling like you're recovering well enough, you're probably doing an optimal amount of volume. And if your performance is going up, but you feel like you could be doing way more and your recovery is just awesome and you feel like your workouts aren't even hard, you should probably do a little bit more volume. So the best way to determine your volume is to look at what you're currently doing and go through some sort of if case scenario decisions and look at your performance and then your subjective and objective recovery. Okay, and using those sort of decision uh, trees that I spoke about. If you're feeling good, your performance is improving, maybe you want to add a little bit more volume. If you're feeling under recovered and your performance is not improving, you probably need to reduce your volume a little bit. And that's just a simple way of looking at it. Now, for anyone who doesn't know how many sets they're doing, um, if you're a beginner, anything above what you're doing at the moment is going to get you some good growth. So a beginner is and a novice is somebody who has been training less than six months, probably not training at all consistently. So, you know, just training consistently with uh, anywhere from say five to 10 sets per week per muscle group is going to be a good starting point. If you're an intermediate and you don't know your set volumes, somewhere from eight to 15 sets per week per muscle group, it's going to be a good starting point. And if you're late intermediate, potentially early advanced, anywhere from 10 to 20 sets per week per muscle group uh, is going to be a good starting point. And it's also really important when you're talking about how much volume we want to be using to consider some of the other variables as well, because you could get better growth if uh, on the same volume, you might not need to do more volume um, to get better growth if you improve your technical execution of the lifts, if you start sleeping better, you start stressing less. So volume is a really tricky one because we have so many factors that affect how much volume we can perform and recover from. And this will change all the time because we work with people, as you know, Ash, who have very undulating, you know, uh, lifestyles, you know, work stresses pick up, they have kids, they sleep well some nights, some nights they don't sleep well, uh, you know, their eating can be a little bit all over the place, they go out on the weekends, drink alcohol. Um, so volume can, can change. But the important thing to remember is we just need that sufficient amount of work. And that sufficient amount of work is not a precise target, it's a range. So as long as we're training within the range and we're able to do an amount of work that is stimulating that we can recover from, then that's the most important thing that you need to satisfy for training. Don't think of it as like this perfect set number that you need to be hitting. It's always going to be a range. That's, a good, that's, that's very good advice. I guess that would also lead me into my next question. And if, if someone was looking to build a program for themselves, or perhaps it's a, it's a coach looking to build a program for their client and with the goal in mind of trying to build muscle and they want to train, let's say for instance, an example, let's say four days a week, how, what would you do in that instance in terms of um, building a training program? Is it something you would also look at as like mesocycles and microcycles? Um, and how often should training be changing? Yes, yeah, so it's a really good question there. So for the, for the listeners who might be familiar with the terminology um, Ash was referring to there, so a mesocycle is basically um, weeks to months of training. Okay, it's like a training cycle. It's like you know four to six weeks generally of training. That's a mesocycle. And then each of those weeks within that mesocycle are what are called microcycles. So when we're designing a program, I like to have the mesocycle. I like to usually have what's called a training block, which is multiple mesocycles. And I look at, those, say, for example, three mesocycles within that training block. And let's call this a booty uh, specialization program, right? So that's the block is a glute specialization program. Now we have three phases. 
So say six weeks each. So it's 18, week, uh, 18 weeks of training, uh, which are the mesocycles, three mesocycles. And we could have, for example, the first phase, which is a base strength phase. So we might want to look to familiarization of, you know, uh, the technique on say the hip thrust, the squat, the deadlift. We want to just build some base strength um, and improve technique. Then the second phase, uh, second mesocycle would be say an accumulation cycle. We're starting to really push volume up to as high as we can and improve work capacity, get as much stimulus as we can. And then that third phase, we might have like what's called an intensity phase where we really start to drive, you know, uh, high intensity training. So closer to failure, um, you know, we could use some intensity techniques such as drop sets, supersets, giant sets, uh, force reps, partials, all those kind of things. Yeah, for a bit of fun as well. Like these things aren't necessarily the, the most optimal way to go about training for high pressure. We could want it to be fun. We want it to be interesting. And I think at a phasic approach like that, um, where you have a different focus on each phase is a really good way for people to continually stay motivated and vary training enough so they don't get bored and feel monotonous about things. And we're still getting that mechanical tension and sufficient exposure to the tension throughout all three, right? Because remember, muscle growth isn't a, there's no way to train for it. It's an outcome that happens based on getting that tension stimulus and enough of it, right? So that's how I would look at the long-term approach. And then when I start to zoom in, what I do is I would start at the first week of that first mesocycle and look to designing that micro cycle. So that weekly training schedule, how many times a week can this person train? Four times a week, great. Well, we know from the research that we want to be training each muscle group about two times a week potentially more. So I looked at potentially having a split where we would be training each of the muscle groups that this person wants to grow. And if it's a glute specialization program twice a week, so we might have hip thrusts potentially three times a week. They're not a very fatiguing movement. We might have uh, squats twice a week, deadlifts once a week. And then we would look to, because that's the priority. Those are the glutes and the legs are the priority. So that's where we would start. Then we'd start piecing in the other exercises and build out that program from there. So it could look um, anything from like, uh, an upper body, or sorry, lower body, upper body, lower body, full body, something like that, um, or upper, lower, upper, lower, like they're the, the splits, but I don't necessarily look at a training split. I look more so to how often can we train this muscle group and get it to recover. We know from the research that a muscle would generally recover um, you know, in protein synthetic rate of uh, the muscle once it's stimulated. We'll return to baseline after 48 to 72 hours. So usually the muscle is good to go every 72 hours, right? Um, depending on how much stimulus and how much damage and fatigue there was in that prior session, right? Um, and then moving from there, we would just start to add in other muscle groups and exercises that this person wants to train. Um, and we make sure that we tick those boxes of they're doing the sufficient amount of sets, whether it's anywhere from 10 to 20 is probably a good starting place. Um, we would want to then set our RPEs for the main lifts. And we generally want to keep the main lifts anywhere from RP six to eight, because as I said, um, you know, some of them are quite technical. They've got a high risk of injury. Uh, we want to be able to progress those over the following weeks. So we want to keep a few reps in reserve. They're usually lower rep range stuff. So we don't need to train them close to power to get a good stimulus. Um, and then the other exercises that are in the higher rep ranges, your machines, isolation exercises, uh, we would you know, have an RP of anywhere from like seven to nine, potentially 10. And we progress that over the mesocycle. And the most important thing that people need to consider is once you get the training right in that microcycle, you're training hard, you're lifting heavy, and you're doing enough work, provided you're getting all of those things right, your hypertrophy should come to you. You should be growing. And as you grow and get bigger, your muscles can produce more force relative to their size, which means to keep up with the gains that you're making from that training program you wrote at the start, if it's working, you will have to add weight to the bar. You will have to do more reps with the same weight. And that's progressive overload. So progressive overload is something that should happen organically if you get your training right. So when we set up this big phase of you know looking to build muscle, the best way to measure are we getting bigger and is my are my glutes growing? Is can they perform better than what they did at the start of this training cycle? Now, all else being equal, they should be able to perform better. Your hip thrust strength should go up for the moderate rep ranges. Your adduction exercises, your abduction exercises should be going up. Your, you know, your glute kickbacks, all these kind of things, even if you're doing it with a band. You should be able to do more reps on a stronger band, whatever the case may be. Your performance should be increasing if you get that training set up right and you are building muscle. As I said, all else being equal, there's a few rabbit holes we can go down here, but I won't. But that's the key. When you're setting up a program, you basically just want to tick the big rocks of getting that intensity right. So training hard enough, training heavy enough, getting the volume right, the frequency, 
and then you start to get into exercise selection, which will be dictated by your goals. And it's a bit of a tricky one to discuss without like context of the person that we're working with. Um, but we can get into more of that later. I hope I answered the question there. Actually. You did, it did. And you kind of led me into that next question is that's something that I wanted to know a little bit more about is the exercise selection. Like how critical is it in terms of uh, a program select exercises? Yeah, it is important. It's an important consideration, not as important as your volume, frequency and intensity, um, but it's probably secondary to those because the exercise that you use is the vehicle that allows you to put the tension on the muscles. And if you don't have the right vehicle, you're not going to be able to efficiently and effectively direct the tension from the external load, which is, or the external resistance, which is the, the dumbbell, the barbell, uh, the cable, whatever it is, onto the muscle group, right? onto the target muscle group. So exercise selection is important. You want to select exercises that have a favorable stimulus to fatigue ratio. That is that when you perform that movement, it's putting a lot of stimulus onto the target muscle group. It's training that muscle and training it hard. And it's not causing you to get too fatigued in other muscle groups and other ways. So for example, here's a good one. Now, if you're somebody who has really, really long femurs, which is your thigh muscle, thigh bone, not muscle, <laughs> and you have a very short torso, okay? Your squat is going to be, or and a long torso as well, but if you have long femurs, essentially your squat is going to be very uh, bent over. You're going to be leaning forward quite a lot, which means just to get your hips below parallel, which is where we start to target, target the quads a lot, right? That's where you get the most stimulus for the quads is when your hips go below your knees as you squat. The more forward leaning you are, the less stimulus is going to be on your quads, the more of that stimulus is going to be on your, your hips and your lower back. The more upright you are, if you have shorter and shorter femurs, longer and longer torso, the more upright you are, if you're squatting like me, you're going to, and you get your hips below parallel, there's going to be a lot more stimulus on your quads. So little individual factors like that in terms of our limb lengths can change our biomechanics of how we perform the movements. And that will alter how much stimulus and fatigue we get for an exercise. So this is why if you want to build a muscle, you should try to, select exercises that allow you to maximally stimulate the muscle group that you want to be growing and don't fatigue other muscle groups um, and joints too much, right? Because the more fatigue you get, that's going to impact your ability to put tension on the muscle because you won't be able to train as much or as hard, right? And you're just getting less stimulus per repetition. So that's not a good idea. Some other considerations are whether or not you can overload that exercise um, in a very small and incremental manner. Right, so what I mean by that is uh, the, the dumbbell lateral raise is a really horrible uh, movement for the side delts because if you have uh, fixed increments of say uh, one kilo up to ten kilos, that's a ten percent increase pretty much you know all the way through, right? Even more uh, when you're a lighter weights, and then when you get to ten kilos and you have to go to twelve kilos as your next load increment, that's a twenty percent increase, and your lateral delt is a tiny muscle group that will take you potentially six to twelve months longer to be able to progress to be able to increase from 10 to 12 kilos and perform the same amount of reps like that is a huge progression so the, the lateral down um because it's so small makes the dumbbell side raise and the fixed progressions that we have unless we add micro plates onto the side we stick a tape them on things like that that's a really bad exercise for hypertrophy because we can't load it in a very micro way so micro loadability is, is a very very useful thing for hypertrophy because as i said as the muscle gets bigger, it can do more work, but we want it because the muscle growth happens so slowly and the, our ability to measure that in our training. So our performance happens at such a slow rate over the course of weeks, months, and it slows down exponentially as you get more advanced. Uh, we need exercises that allow us to overload in a very small way. Now you think about the leg press on the other hand, you could be doing 200 kilos and add just 1.25 kilo plank. Perth, that is a great muscle building exercise because you can lift such a large amount of weight, but then overload it by such a teeny amount of weight. That makes it perfect for building muscle. So we need to consider those kind of things. Um, and we also need to think about the range of motion that the exercise trains um, and whether or not it's uh, stimulating the muscle in uh, diff at different lengths and uh, peak contraction positions. So basically, if we think about the hip thrust, uh, that only trains the glutes in a contracted position, right? In a shortened position. 
So it gives a good stimulus in that peak contraction where we extend our hips, where we lift our hips up. We're getting a lot of stimulus in that contracted position, but we're not getting a lot of stimulus in the stretched and lengthened position. Remember we said the mechanical tension is about the force, so the contraction, but it's also about that lengthening. So, so the hip thrust on its own is probably not the best glute builder. Um, we probably want to include something like a squat where we're stretching the glutes as we go down into squat or an RDL or a deadlift where we're stretching the glutes because that's been shown to be a really important uh, component of mechanical tension. So we need to look at factors like that. And again, this is where a very educated coach such as the guys at Squat Club uh, come in handy because they know these things and they can piece together a program to make sure that it, it fills the gaps in your exercises are getting uh, you know, tension in both the shortened and the lengthened position. Uh, you get a good stimulus to fatigue ratio because they understand biomechanics um, and they pick exercises that can be overloaded in an appropriate way. So I think they're the, probably the most important things. Um, there's a lot of other things to consider, such as somebody's orthopedic profile, whether they can actually meet the positional demands of the movement, they have the stability, mobility, strength and control to do so. Um, but these things are very hard, as we mentioned earlier, to discuss without having someone here in front of me to uh, talk about but nonetheless something to consider yeah definitely and i think um i agree 100 agree with all of them i think as well another one could have been um uh, we also as, as coaches we want to make sure that we're getting you know a client buy-in so exercise selection can also be of choice totally. you know towards the end of the part of the program if we're if we're you know ticking off all the boxes that are required um, in terms of a program in terms of the muscle um you know then we also want to make sure that the, they are enjoying the training program and they are choosing uh, exercises that they, they like to enjoy. You know, consistency really, is, is obviously a, a is big key. And, and like we said, Ash, uh, you know, muscle growth is not an exercise dependent process. And if you're loving what you're doing, it feels good and it's within the ballpark of what's right. Um, and that means that you're going to do it consistently for long periods of time. Well, that's the most important thing for muscle growth is staying in the game. You know, continually training hard uh, over many, many years is how you build the muscle. So if uh, you have to deviate a little bit away from optimal to find enjoyment, uh, that's totally fine in my books. Mm. Now, with that, if we are training, you know, with a heavy load and we are training quite frequently and, um, you know, there are, uh, we are placing a lot of stress on the muscle, um, over time our body's going to start to fatigue. Do you want to explain a little bit about the deloads and how they work and where yeah, what's what's the de focus with that? Deloads, deloads are for pussies, man. You don't <laughs> need them. Uh, anyone who deloads is just weak. They're not training hard enough, um, and they need to really have a good hard look at themselves in the mirror <laughs> um, because we don't do deloads at JPS. We're hardcore and we want to make gains. <laughs> it's in the water, hey. It's in the it's in the Melbourne water. Yeah. Yes, COVID nineteen apparently in our water. Um, no. So deloads are very important because any adaptation that is cumulative, such as muscle growth, means that fatigue is gonna be cumulative also. Okay, so what happens is we have uh, acute fatigue, like when we train, when we train, we get out of breath, that's fatigue. You're out of breath and you recover, you catch your breath, your heart rate drops down, but it doesn't affect you for the days after that you ran out of breath. You get your breath back, you're, you're fine. Even, even sometimes an hour later, you get your breath back, your body temperature comes down, stop sweating, have a shower, you're good. But there are other types of fatigue that last longer and they accumulate. It's called residual because we don't just drop off all this fatigue uh, you know, from session to session when we have a day off from training. There's actually this fatigue that just, just builds up. It's like you know the junk in your closet. You just keep throwing it back there and forget about it, go live and you're good. You can keep living and you keep throwing a little bit back there and it never really catches up to you. But eventually you put enough in there and it, the door flies open and everything just falls out onto the floor and you go, holy shit, where did this come from? Now you've disrupted my living. I have to take time, a whole day out to clean it. That's kind of like what happens when we train. We have all this fatigue that just picks up in the background. We don't really feel it because we recover. We feel good enough to train hard again. But eventually it catches up to the point where our performance starts to drop off. We start to feel really shitty. We start to feel that we get a little bit of a cold, a little bit sick, sluggish. We're not motivated to train. These are some of the signs and symptoms that you might need to deload. And we need to take a full week uh, of lower volume. So we reduce volume generally by 40 to 50%. So as a rule of thumb, I like to cut my volume in half when I'm taking a deload. So if I'm doing uh, 10 sets for a muscle group per week, I'll go down to five sets per muscle group for the entire week because volume has the most... Um, significant impact on fatigue 
and what we like to do with intensity because intensity actually drives the adaptations, the type of adaptations we get. And it also uh, keeps our adaptations around. So it maintains our fitness. So what I like to do with intensity, we don't want to drop our intensity down straight away because we might lose some of our fitness. And we know that volume has the greatest contribution to fatigue. So we can drop volume down. We can keep intensity high for the first start of the week. And then in the later half of the week, we drop intensity down a little bit so we get a full recovery from hard training and doing a lot of training. So volume comes down, just to recap, by about 50% for the entire week, and intensity will stay the same. So RPE, load, very similar, maybe 10% reduction, very small. Uh, we'll keep that for the first half of the week, and then the second half of the week, then we then taper it down so that we get a full replenishment of uh, all of the systems uh, that we fatigue when we train. Hey, I. I can say from first-hand experience how much I love deload weeks. It's something that I look forward to coming up to my end of my phase. And Guys and girls, you know, just so you know, Ash's entire six-week mesocycles are basically a deload. Okay? So <laughs> that's why he like loves his deload weeks so much because his mesocycles are deloads. Uh, mate, I, I thoroughly <laughs> enjoy my, my time off and my... my uh, Lower intensities. I really, really enjoy it. <laughs> no, uh, no disrespect to your coaching, though. <laughs> All right, mate. Uh, so get, let's talk about a little bit about the um, how much the, the speed of muscle growth. Uh, does training experience play into this? It certainly does. It certainly does. So beginners can build a lot more muscle than somebody who's been lifting for a little while, and someone who's been lifting for a little while can build muscle at a faster rate than somebody who's been lifting for a very, very long time. And the reason for this is because it appears that the body has uh, this inbuilt sort of limit for how much muscle mass it wants to carry and it can carry. Okay, so there's a limit to sort of how much everybody uh, can build naturally, right? And obviously, uh, uh, Mexican supplements uh, can help increase the amount of muscle that we would normally be able to carry. Uh, so there seems to be this genetic limit that we have. Now, as we get closer to that limit, the more and more muscle we build, the slower and slower, the harder and harder it becomes to build that muscle. And this is because uh, in our body, we have what's called negative feedback loops, which are basically the more of an input we get, the less of an output we produce, which is like hunger. So the more food we put in, the less hungry we get. Now, this is the same for muscle growth. The more training we get, the less muscle we build. So we become... Uh, desensitized essentially to this training stimulus over time. And then we also get closer to our genetic ceiling of how much muscle we can produce. So therefore our rate of muscle gain slows down significantly. So an advanced lifter might only be able to build anywhere from 0.25% of their body weight to 0.5% of their body weight uh, of muscle over the course of a month. Now that's not a lot. Now, if you have, oh, this is going to test my, my mathematics now. If you have an 80 kilo lifter, they're putting on, uh, you know, they put, that's 200 grams a month. That's not a lot. That's not a lot of muscle. Um, and that's weight. And you can't be certain all of that is muscle anyway. Um, so as an advanced lifter, your rate of gain slows down exponentially to the point that it's like watching grass grow. Uh, and you better bloody just enjoy the process, love training hard, uh, because at that point, it, it is going to be very difficult to uh, build muscle because it, it is just the law of diminishing returns uh, being exemplified in our training. So beginners, on the other hand, they can you know grow like weeds. So beginners can gain anywhere from 1% to 2% of their body weight uh, per month, which is quite a bit. Uh, if you're 100 kilos, you know, that's a kilo, two kilos of muscle. Um, and over the course of a year, that's 10 kilos of muscle. You go pick up 10 kilos of meat from uh, your local butcher, put that around your upper body and your torso. Damn, it's pretty, pretty impressive, right? You think about that, you know, two 500 gram steaks either side <laughs> on your chest, right? That's impressive gains. Um, you know, girls, you put two 500 gram pieces of uh, steak on your booties and on each glute, and uh, you'd be like, damn, I'd take that. Uh, so beginners can build quite a bit of muscle. And then intermediates, anywhere from like 0.5 to 1% of their body weight. Per month so there's some good uh, ballpark ranges to be shooting for um yes hope i answered your question there Ash. yeah yeah you did you answered that perfectly uh now let's talk on the nutritional side of things so what are some guidelines and recommendations that you would advise for people who are wanting to build muscle in terms of the nutritional side yeah so oh, this is a funny one because 
to maximize muscle growth, you should be eating in a small calorie surplus, anywhere from 200 to 300 calorie surplus a day, uh, because that will provide your body with sufficient fuel and energy to recover from training. And we know that muscle growth is quite a energy expensive process because we have to build new proteins. It's called anabolism. So we're taking uh, simpler structures and we're making them more complex. So we're not breaking things down like we do in fat loss. We're actually building them up. We're building muscle tissue, right? That costs a lot of energy. So we need to be in a surplus to make sure that we've got enough energy to do all the things we normally do, recover from training, and then we've got a little bit left over so that we can dedicate that to muscle growth. Um, but if you don't want to gain body fat uh, and you're a beginner or you're somebody who's uh, you know, quite new to training, you can eat at maintenance levels. You don't necessarily need, in a, need to eat in a surplus. Um, so depending on your level of advancement, uh, will determine how much of a surplus you should be in because it lines up with your potential to gain muscle mass. As I mentioned earlier, beginners and intermediates have a greater potential to build muscle mass than somebody who's an advanced. So an advanced lifter might need to eat in a you know, relatively small surplus and a beginner and intermediate could eat in like a little bit extra surplus. They might get a little bit extra um, body fat, but they could also lose some body fat and have some cool recomping uh, going on, which has been shown in the literature to be able to occur. Uh, so to summarize that, if you're a beginner, maintenance levels uh if you don't want to gain body fat if you're not too fussed about body fat you want to maximize muscle growth uh a 300 or so calorie surplus if you're an intermediate anywhere from 200 to 300 calories uh an advanced again around 200 to 300 calories surplus per day um and you want to be eating sufficient amount of protein so anywhere from 1.8 to 2.2 grams per kg of body weight is a good starting point uh and then you need to make sure that you're meeting your fat uh, requirements. So I generally recommend starting with one gram of fat per kilo of body weight uh, in the gaining phase. And then the rest of your calories can come from carbohydrates. Uh, and in terms of what we do with our calories, it's a good idea to have our protein distributed evenly throughout the day. So uh, for me, I consume around 200 uh, grams of protein uh, per day. And I like to split that up quite evenly over five meals. Uh, so we generally want to have anywhere from at least three to five meals per day with our protein spread evenly over those uh, because we, we maximize uh, the rate of protein synthesis at each meal. Uh, and it also allows us to reach the leucine threshold uh, that we need to uh, for each meal. So that again, as I said, we maximize that uh, protein synthetic uh, response from the meal and that's good for muscle building. Uh, so three to five meals, evenly spreading your protein over those meals and consuming high quality protein. You know, from uh, animal sources, that's your best uh, bang for buck uh, form of protein. Uh, if you're vegetarian or vegan, you might need to just consume a little bit more protein. So instead of uh, eating at that 1.8 to 2.2 range, you might want to eat from 2.2 to 2.6, just because you, you'll need more protein uh, to make up for the lower quality protein that you're consuming. You need to pair your proteins a little bit if you're vegan or vegetarian. Uh, so you get a full uh, amino acid profile in your meal because you don't have a lot of the essential amino acids that you get in your uh, meat uh, products and besides that ash uh yeah i recommend 80 percent of your diet come from wholesome nutritious unprocessed foods 20 percent from foods of preference uh those you know cheeky treats that we all like to have uh ash mm. you know uses his 20 percent uh on wines and chocolates guys when he goes for his weekends away with missus that is uh, true it is true and you can still build muscle and uh, lose still drinking to this day <laughs> yeah, Ash, we shouldn't be telling people that. We don't uh, encourage alcoholism at uh, Squat Club and JPS. Uh, no, but uh, yeah, they're the big rocks for nutrition. So uh, you have to remember that training is what drives muscle growth and nutrition augments or like facilitates that muscle growth. So it just needs to be something that's there in the background doing all the right things. It's, it's not actually going to build muscle. Uh, for you it's the training so uh, you just need to hit your calories be in a little bit of a surplus for the most time eat enough protein make sure it's high quality protein spread it out evenly throughout the day and if you do those things you're going to be a pretty good spot uh, for the most part all right so you, you've touched on a lot of good points there um but what about the um i guess like the psychological things as you know obviously I, I coach a lot of females and also there are some guys too so when we look at trying to increase their calories um, with the goal of trying to build some muscle, they are afraid of adding on body fat. Yep. How, how can you address that? Uh, how can they get over that thought of adding a little bit of body fat or you know, what do, what, what's your take on it? Okay, so here's the crazy thing. Gaining body fat short term sucks. 
I agree with you there. I agree with everybody there. Nobody wants to gain a little bit of body fat uh, right now because you, you do look a little bit worse. You don't look as good. You don't look as tight. You don't feel as good. Your clothes change a little bit. But if gaining a little bit of body fat allows you to build more muscle, it allows you to eat more food, allows you to enjoy life a little bit more. And over time, by building more muscle, here's the funny thing. The more muscle you have, the better you look at a higher body fat percentage. Because you look differently. The body fat that you have, when you have, if, if you're saying 90 kilos and you have 30% body fat, you're going to look very different to somebody who's 100 kilos and has 15% body fat. Even if you're the same height, same genetics, same everything. By having more muscle mass, even at the same body fat percentage, even if you have this 100 kilo person with the same body fat, they have now 70 kilos of muscle mass on them and 30% body fat. They're going to look so much better being a heavier person with more muscle mass and the same body fat than that person who is 90 kilos, weighs less and has less muscle mass. I guarantee it. So that gain, that fat gain in the short term, it sucks. It doesn't feel good but it is worth it. You get to enjoy life. You get to eat out with your friends a little bit more. You get to go to bed, not starving, not restricting yourself. You get to train harder, perform better, recover better. And over time in the process of gaining that little bit of body fat um, and training really hard and doing all the right things with your um, training and nutrition, you build more muscle. Even if you're at the same body fat percentage as what you were when you started, but you have more muscle mass, you're going to look 10 times better. And that's a fact. And I've seen that person with myself. I've seen that with all my clients. I have more body fat now than I did when I first started lifting, right? Because like I said, I starved myself. I was really skinny. Um, I look better now just because I'm about 20 freaking kilos of lean mass heavier. But I'm at a higher body fat percentage. I've probably got like 5 6% more body fat. But I get to eat more. I get to enjoy having a meal with you know my partner and you know taking my kids out for an ice cream. All these kind of things. that's living. Unless you're doing this to be a physique competitor, or you're the one percent of the population who's going to step on stage, uh, compete at a high level of uh, you know physique show or powerlifting. Man, gain weight, take up more space, be a bigger person, build more muscle, and have more body fat at a heavier body weight. Um, sorry, have the same amount of body fat at a heavier body weight through getting more lean tissue and you'll look better and you'll enjoy life 10 times more. So that's my message for anyone out there who's a little bit afraid of gaining body fat. I feel you, but you just got to trust the process, build some muscle and it'll all pay off in the end. Nicely said, mate. Nicely said. So uh, what about, I guess people obviously been in the industry for a very long time and you've would have seen countless mistakes uh, people were doing, uh, especially like, you know, on social media as well. So what are the top mistakes that you've seen people train for hypertrophy? Uh, there's a few. The first would be uh, the technique. Uh, this is a big one. I think technique's a huge one. Uh, because as I said earlier, your technique is basically the way that you put the tension on the muscle. So if you're squatting, you know, and you're cutting your range of motion really short, you're, you're just doing knee bends or you're doing bench press, you're not touching your chest, or you're doing bicep curls and you're swinging the weight around, there's no tension on the muscle group. I think that's the easiest, the biggest mistake, but the easiest to fix. You're going to drop your ego, leave it at the door, and you've just got to focus on performing the movements as close to the textbook uh, as you can through a full range of motion uh, so that you can actually put tension on the muscle. I think that's a huge mistake. Second to that would be program hopping. And people jumping from one program to the next and not having any consistency in their exercise. It's very easy for me to write a new program for someone that makes them feel sore, keeps them excited, sounds uh, you know, scientific and has all these fancy things and like drop sets, supersets. But as boring as it sounds, the basics work, performing the same six exercises, squat, bench, deadlift, overhead press, vertical pull, horizontal pull, and a thrust. You perform you know, those movements you pick one, you train it hard, you keep getting better over time, that is how you move muscle. There is no need to chop and change uh, all the time. Yes, you want to tweak things here and there so that it don't get stale, uh, you know, get overuse injuries and things like that. But you need to just stick to a program consistently, make small changes to the program in terms of rep ranges, loading zones, exercise order, little things like this. You don't need a new program every eight weeks. You do that, you're going to spin your wheels, you're not going to build any muscle. Uh, and the third one, would be chopping and changing, not from uh, training programs, but from their goals. So they'll do a gaining phase for four to six weeks, and then they'll start fat loss. 
they lose fat for a little bit or they can't get the fat loss right, they go back to it again. And it's this cyclical dieting. The best thing that girls and guys can do because guys have just as uh, big an issue with the body image, the eating disorder stuff as females, believe you me, uh, it's just not spoken about as much and it's not good for their muscle gaining efforts either. The best thing that anyone can do is dedicate 12, 24 months, not dieting for weight loss, building muscle, focusing on changing behaviors, mindset, psychology, around body image, around food, uh, exercise, getting strong, getting good at lifting, training for a different reason. Instead of training to change the way you look, training to perform better and test your body and see what it's capable of uh, and fall in love with that process, it makes dieting for fat loss a lot easier. But it also gives you the opportunity to build some serious muscle uh, instead of always going through this on and off, cutting, bulking, cutting, bulking. Uh, you've got to dedicate some time to it because uh, you know I don't recommend a, a mass gaining phase or a muscle gaining phase for anything less than uh, you know 12, 16 weeks minimum. You tell me how many females, males are willing to do that? Not many, if any. How many dudes you know got the skill to go? Rock a show like this, Ash. <laughs> oh, I wish I knew the lyrics. I could have carried on. <laughs> I was hoping that you would. But anyway, uh, yeah, that be the top three. So to recap that, it's technique. First, second, program hopping from changing one program to the next. And then third is just uh, cyclical dieting. Mate, I'm actually really glad that you said that because they're the things that I say that out to people that are, you know, that I, um, that I'm in contact with. So, you know, you, by you reiterating that, you know, that's going to make it even clearer for especially the people that, you know, that I, that I see day to day. So, um, I couldn't be happy that you said those things. <laughs> I'm glad, man. I'm glad. <laughs> Uh, mate, I just want to throw out a last question for you. So this is more about you. So if you could go back to where it all started, but you had to choose a different pathway. So it wasn't the fitness industry. What do you think you would be doing now? Oh, I'd be a lawyer. Really? I studied law for three years. I had one year to go uh, in my degree. I was studying a undergraduate bachelor of law and uh, commerce, and I'd completed three years. I got uh, pretty good grades. I think I averaged the highest distinction uh, across my three years, and uh, I'd done my internship, my placement. I had actually th uh, two or three job offers uh, once I'd finished graduating. Uh, and then in my final year, JPS was booming, and I uh, pulled the pin. So I think if uh, things didn't happen the way they did, I'd definitely be in a suit in an office, uh, acting in Harvey, Harvey Specter. Oh, I could only hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that good looking, but Just, hopefully uh, I'm yeah. that successful. <laughs> oh, mate. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, uh, for chatting with me. Um, if anyone would like to see more of Jacob and I highly, highly suggest you do go and read everything that he is posting on social media. He gives out a ton of free knowledge, um, and a lot of takeaways for people. Uh, they can find him, you know, if you, look, Jay, I, don't, I don't even think you really need to do the direct Instagram handles these days. If you can, you know, search up Jacob Skeppers on Instagram, go and find JPS Health and Fitness on Instagram and also JPS Education. Those three pages there alone is going to change your world. Uh, I know, like, actually, I haven't spoken to you before about this, is that I remember coming across, uh, I think it was actually, JPS Health and Fitness first on Instagram. Uh, it probably would have been, I would say, three and a half, I'd say, big, but close to, yeah, about three and a half years ago. And I saw the page and then I started digging around and seeing your stuff too. And the amount of knowledge that you guys had at the very beginning, when I first saw you guys, like I was so impressed and I, I threw out a follow straight away. Um, and I've kind of followed your journey, uh, JPS journey. Uh, then migrating into JPS education, you know, it's been, um, it's, it is, it's great to, to watch you grow. Um, you really are, you you are, we've had this phone call uh, a couple of weeks ago or last week saying that, you know, you are very well respected in the industry. You are raising the standards for personal trainers um, and you're, you're getting rid of all the bullshit that's around because we both know there's a lot of bullshit in the industry, uh, social media as well. It's all these, influencers and you know pushing incorrect uh terminologies and the, the way that they train as well you know and you're 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 making a, a big difference so uh especially for someone like as myself who you know likes to surround themselves around well-educated 
personal trainers in the industry and researchers and seen the correct literature, literature, you are, you are a breath of fresh air and you know, it's people like you that make a massive difference in the industry and for many people around the world. So I firstly just want to say thank you so much for doing what you do, mate, because you, you, you change a lot of lives and you've, you've changed my life as well. And that's, uh, yeah, incredible to hear. It's very, uh, yeah, flattering. I don't really know what to no, say. No, mate, look, you know what? There was, there was no need to. I, that, that came off the bat. Really, I was just trying to give you a plug at the first part, but you know, my heart came out. And, um, mate, I, I just want you to know that I, I, I regard you very, very high. And, you know, it's a, it is a massive honor for, for me to be able to sit down with you and have this conversation for the last hour. I really, really appreciate it. And I, I honestly... I hope that every single person that is listening to these episodes is to go and follow you, go and follow JPS health and fitness and go and follow JPS education because those three pages will change the way that you train and you know, you will maximize the way that you train for your goals dramatically. So uh, go and follow them. But, Thank you, uh, mate. Mate, you're very welcome, mate. Thank you so much for joining me and answering those questions. And I can guarantee that you would have helped a lot of people um, on this episode. Hopefully man. Thank you for having me. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it.